Welcome out there in Facebook land. I think we're on. Let me make sure we're on in Facebook land. Shows we're on. <laughs> we'll try it now, sharing it, and see if it works. Uh, yeah, go ahead and do that. Hi, guys. How are you? Hey, yay. If anybody got a chance to watch our new overseer online the other night, uh, that was kind of uh, interesting. Uh, seems like a really nice guy. I, I, he did a uh, he did a great job in uh, in Alaska. So we'll hope he does a great job here. We believe he will. Uh, hopefully, we'll get him down here to meet everybody at some point to come down and uh, preach for us or whatever. But. Uh, just, a, just a good guy, seems like, and, and again, done a great job, so be praying for Brother Wright and uh, his wife. Uh, also, if if you got a call today, ha, some of you did, uh, be praying about teaching. We need teachers and all those big things, and uh, uh, we need to be ministering to the young. How many know that the church thrives on the senior saints? We, we are... We are the ones that, that it thrives on. We're the ones that show up and get most everything done sometimes. But, uh, but without youth, there is no church of the future. There has to be a church of the future. So how do we do that? We teach them. We feed them. We grow them. That's our job. So that's what we want to do. Amen, right? Amen. All right. Um, Miss Faye, uh, as you know, had a, a, a loss in her family. So we are postponing. Not this coming week, but till the first Sunday night in October. So we're not having her uh, service this Sunday night, the first one in October. Right? Ha! Your son did a good job Sunday. He did a good job. Uh, I'd never heard that song before, but it, uh, it definitely had a good message to it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started tonight on Revelation chapter 14, Revelation uh, or if you're one of them old school folks, it's Revelations, right? Uh, most of us did that all of our lives. Uh, Father, we thank you today for who you are and for what you do. I thank you that you're in our midst no matter what, dear Lord. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. Tonight, I pray, Father, that you would just give us the words to say, that we would understand what you have for us. And we give you honor tonight. We give you praise in your precious name. Amen. We're on chapter 14 of Revelation. Like the last couple of weeks, we're going to do an overview, so we're not doing a real deep, in-depth study. I would say this to you. If you enjoy history and, and geography and those type things, study the Battle of Armageddon. We're going to touch a little bit there tonight, but, but study that out because it's a really, really, really neat study, and there's a lot of good information on that out there. Uh, so study that out. We won't do in-depth tonight, but uh, last time we looked at the main players, Jesus, the false prophet, the Antichrist, the dragon, the woman, the beast, etc. Uh, that was chapter 13, which was two weeks ago, and then the last thing in chapter 13 is talks about the mark of the beast. So I'm going to touch there for about 45 seconds tonight. You ready? Uh, we know that the system is already in place for that. The system for any type of any type, whether that be a, um, a monetary, whatever it is, there's systems in place to handle that around the world right now. So we know that that is in place. Uh, we know, but it also know that it depends upon worship of the beast. It's worship. It's not just stick a chip in you about groceries. It's not about that. It's about worship. That's what they're not going to let you eat because of worship. But again, this is during the tribulation. Uh, if you believe pre-trib or mid-trib, you won't be here for that. If you believe post-trib, enjoy the ride, right? Uh, but uh, moving right along. It's about a one-world government and a monetary system somewhat, uh, but it's not a cause for fret or fear. So many people build fear. And if, if, if you've seen any of these things going around right now online, let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. Don't post it. If you don't know it's true, how many got the, uh, the, the message about, uh, uh, let's see, this one was, was a funny one. How about this? That Joe Biden went to sleep during an interview, and he's sitting there snoring, and the lady's talking to him, trying to wake him up. If you go back and actually research that, 
that interview was from a long time ago with someone else who actually did go to sleep, but it had nothing to do with Joe Biden. He was looking down, and they looped the camera and then linked them together. It's not true. It's not true. So don't be careful when you share stuff like that. And the things about the mark of the beast and all this, we read it, and our emotions take off, and we're like, <gasps> and the next thing you know, we want to share it with the world, and it's simply not there. And all it does is create fear when God told us not to have fear, right? So there you go. That's my take on it. Chapter 14. Don't fret, don't fear, because God's got this thing. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, I want to sum up chapter 14 for you tonight by reading some of the Psalms. I'm going to read to you from Psalms 37. Psalms 37. And beginning with verse 35, and just listen to the words of this, and it pretty much sums up chapter 14. Uh, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yeah, I sought him, but he could not be found. Then my favorite verse in the Bible, in the King James, Mark, the perfect man. It's in there, you can't deny it. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Uh, Mark, you like that verse too, right? Mark the perfect man, that's why we read the King James, that verse right there. Uh, but the transgressor shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Everything we're studying is to teach us to be ready in our hearts. It's not to produce fear because God wins, period. God wins. He will never leave you, never forsake you, no matter how ugly things look. Get your mind off the ugly and get it on the Lord. Somebody say amen. All right, summarizing chapter 14. If you got that, say amen. amen. We don't have our mic hooked up, do we? Oh, well, we'll wing it tonight. Good crowd tonight. Good-looking crowd, mostly. No, I'm just kidding. Good to see the Nelsons back with us. Ha! Wait, hang on, we got to wait for it. I see him jump up out there in the lobby at his post and come running this way. Verse, verse 1, chapter 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harps, harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. And the elders and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. If we go back to Revelation chapter 7, that's in your notes. I think I threw that in there that you could look back. The hundred and forty-four thousand is twelve thousand from the tribes of Israel, twelve thousand from each tribe. Uh, we believe from this, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, but we believe that the 144,000 are men. You say, why is it men? Because most of the time in the Eastern culture, the men are counted and the women are there. The women and the children are there and the men are counted, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. But we believe that 144,000 is men. And the scripture says that there's uh, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, and they're standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Who, does, who represents the Lamb? Jesus. Now, we know that this is the tribulation. We don't know the exact time frame, but let me throw a time frame at you. His feet won't touch earth again until he's back for the millennial reign. That's the first time his feet will touch the earth. Whether you believe in pre-tib, post-tib, none of that applies here. When his feet touch Mount Zion, there'll be a great earthquake uh, in front of the eastern gate in Israel. Uh, they've, they've put graves because the eastern gate's sealed right now. He'll be the first one to go through there, right? 
And we know that to be true. And the gate sealed and has been for a long, long time. Why is there graves in front of it if you look it up? Because uh, Jesus the Nazarite can't touch a dead body, right? Because it, that would break his vow. Trust me, they're not going to be there when his feet touch Mount Zion. It's going to open up. So, but that's getting ahead of myself. Where did you come from? Don't you do that. Okay. Oh, I know what's going on. Hang on. Bear with me. Just get out of my way. Uh, when I move my computer back and forth from the house to here, uh, and it connects to a different internet, sometimes it won't boot all the emails up, and when it does that, it keeps flashing up my email and blocking my notes. We'll be all right. So think about all that's going on in the world system. It appears to be the end of the tribulation. That's where we believe this is at. Jesus has stepped down, or the Lamb, the image of the Lamb has stepped down onto the Mount of Olives. So we know that this is the closure of the tribulation time, or at least that's what we're looking at right here. Uh, some could argue in a verse from Galatian, uh, some other things, but, but by all speculation, this is the end of the tribulation when Christ returns to earth. Um, try to picture that with, with John there and, and how this relates. Uh, again, they're overviewing, then they'll go back and break it down. Uh, but if you look at it from there, the world system has crushed anyone who would not bow down. And now there is standing the Lamb with 144,000 that are sealed without spot or blemish. Uh, Satan has not been able to touch them. Of course, when God says it's settled, it's settled. Then a voice from heaven thunders of many waters. Uh, possibly the same voice that we would have heard for John, or when Jesus was being baptized. Uh, these are mine and I am well pleased. These are uh, the, the Jews, the original chosen people. Uh, and they're here, and I'll let you speak in just a minute if you want to put some stuff in, because, again, a lot of this is speculation. But it says they're singing a song that only they can sing. Harps, and it's a new song, a song only they know. I wish we knew more about that, but it's a song that cannot be sung except by those that have come through, that have come through the tribulation. So the song that they're going to be singing is one that, that we won't be singing with them unless we're singing it from the heavenly realms on the way back. But it's, I believe this is a special song for the Jewish people that are singing about their deliverance through the Messiah. Any comments yet? No? Moving on. Huh? Okay, well, I, any in here? Nobody said anything, so... I don't know what the song is, but I can give you a hint and of why I understand it. The Greek word literally means for learn in the scripture there. The word learn, L-E-A, they learn a new song. The Greek word means uh, it's experimental. In other words, they had to experience something to sing this song. They, there was an experience that came with learning. And the word in the, in the King James is learn. Uh, other translations, a different word, but it literally means in order to sing it, they had to experience it. Does that make sense? It's kind of why we get where we're at. All right, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled by women. Anybody care to guess what the Greek word for women is right there? Scared, aren't you? It's goon. Goon. Moving right along. They which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits. That's why we know it's the Jewish people. It's being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Uh, one of the speculations is, well, the 144,000 is... It can be men, women, and children. Uh, and that means, when they're talking about it being virgins, means purity. That's a good theology. However, the original language says that they were not defiled with women and that the women, or, or that the men were pure, they were virgins. The word virgin actually translates out pretty good. Uh, and, and so to say that that means, well, it just means purity is not necessarily accurate. It means these were men and that they had not defiled their body 
with a woman at all. And so um, it, I believe that in chapter 7 it says that there was 144,000 a great multitude which followed which no man can number. I believe the women and children go with that. So when you see the numbers that came out of Israel in the Exodus, they number the men, but then when you average in that an average household in Egypt or in Israel at that time was 2.3. So what's the average household here? How many people have two or more children? Raise your hands. How many have less than that? Right? So it averages out to where if you've got, you know, 144,000, there could be millions by the time you figure everything in. Children, grandchildren, and all those things. But... Uh, verse 4 tells us that they are virgins, not defiled by women. Many commentators believe it's symbolic for purity. I don't, because literally it is written in that they were virgins. Uh, one theory is that they were washed in the blood, and that makes them like virgins. But it doesn't say they were like virgins. It says they were. Um, however, if you read the text and look into the Greek, the words for women and virgin directly relate to men who have been never been with a woman. Chapter 7 tells us 144,000 from the tribes, from an Eastern culture mindset, they would only be men, and then the great multitude of women and children that went with them. Uh, Brown calls them the first fruits of the tribulation, so does the context here. Uh, side notes there is in your notes should be 1 Peter 2.22 tells us that Jesus was pure and had no deceit found in his mouth. Jude 24 tells us that we can have that same hope of being pure. Now, how are we going to be pure before God? Huh? If we repent, if we truly repent before God and, and we walk in the righteousness of Christ, then what is seen of us is the righteousness of Christ. And But that is pre-tribulation stuff. So it, things kind of shift here uh, when the wrath of God is being poured out, or at least I believe they do. But reality says that we can be pure too. Uh, I think about this a lot. I think about a lot about our walk. How many people in this room have said negative things today? Okay, anybody not said negative things today? Uh, I haven't been around anybody all day, so I haven't said a word. I've spoke nothing to no one, right? But the truth is, when we do that, when we begin to add fear to our lives, when we begin to add things to it that God said don't do, then technically there's not purity there. Um, so we repent. I hope you repent daily. I hope you truly, earnestly repent daily. Uh, many times from what you didn't even know you did, right? Uh, but I don't want to open a can of worms tonight, but... In America, there's become a laxed Christian culture, a very relaxed or lax Christian culture. We look at everything as okay. We justify, uh, you said a prayer when you were eight years old and everything's in good with you and God. It may be that, you know, you're living in 1,600 different sins, but God's looking the other way. And I simply can't find that in Scripture. Um, the nutshell is this, God said, be holy, for I am holy. Go ahead, Faith. Yeah, and also says, the, pure shall see God. the pure shall see God. Very good, Miss Faye, very good. All right, any questions up to here? I know it's just kind of jumbled, but we're getting there. Ah, and I saw another angel, this is the second angel, flying them, or the first one of these six. In the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Remember, this is the judgment of God being poured out, not the Antichrist. And worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
We're going to see about six angels in the next few verses. This is the first one. But this angel's preaching the gospel. And this is, to me, is an important key. If we look at Scripture right now, before the book of Revelation, do you see anywhere that there is an angel preaching the gospel? When Jesus left, Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe, or chapter 9, verse 16, it says that we are to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Up until this time, it is man's responsibility, according to Jesus Christ, to share the gospel. It is man's responsibility. Now we see this angel, and that may not mean much to you, but to me, I'm looking at it and I'm going, whoa, things are really over now because now this is going to be done by an angel, not by man. And then I stop and go back to that purity thing. How many know you're not going to be judged by sin? If you're saved, you're not going to be judged by sin. If you're repentant and truly saved, you're not going to be judged by your sin. But everywhere you find judgment in Scripture, or at least in the book of Revelation, guess what goes with it? Works. Works, works, works. You will be judged when you get there. Everybody thinks it's, hey, it's cool, I made it, I'm in the gate, no problems. That is not the actual context of what Scripture says. Scripture says that when you get there, you're going to be judged by your works. Your works are what he asked you to do and you didn't. That's not sin related, that's works related. And, and to all seven of the churches, the very first thing he said is, I know your works, I know your works, I know your works. If you're looking in Corinthians, he literally says, if you're looking in other books, he literally says, I will, you will be judged by your works. That's not entering in or not entering in, but that could be, again, a can of worms, but it could be a status. And I don't know about you, but I've been on the bottom end of the ladder long enough. I want to do everything I can here to maybe have my works honor God. And I wonder today, and I know y'all are the faithful. Good, again, good looking crowd. I know you're the faithful, but I wonder how many, how many are truly out there doing the work of the Father and sharing the gospel. How many of us are actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? It doesn't take much to do this right here, to, re to memorize John 3.16 and tell people God loves them. It doesn't take much to share what he did for you. How many's got a testimony beyond I just got saved? I mean, I, a, a testimony of what he brought you out of. Sterling, I know you've been brought out of some junk. We all have. The truth is we have, and we've got a testimony. And if someone starts, if the door is open, jump through it. I get more out of Revelation about this than you probably do and, and that's maybe my fault but I would rather stand before God having shared when he told me not to or didn't tell me to than to stand before God and answer for why I didn't you want to know why it says that he'll wipe away tears because you're going to be heartbroken to stand before the God of all creation that gave everything he had for you and answer for not doing what you were called to do. Throw one more out there and we'll move on. He says there, don't worry about or the scripture that we have, some of the scripture that we have here. Let me back up. Uh, don't worry about, it's in your notes, I can't find it in mine. Don't worry about the one that can kill the body. Worry about the one that can kill the body and soul. When we went to school originally into ministry school, here's one thing they said. And they said it jokingly, and maybe I shouldn't say it in mixed company, but he said, men, ladies, don't let 15 minutes of earthly pleasure destroy an eternity. Speaking of sexual sin. Don't let unforgiveness steal your eternal glory. I'm, I'm going to move on. Anybody got anything to say? Because 
I know, we're quiet tonight. This is a tough one. And the third angel followed him, verse 9, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The very first commandment says, have no other God before me. If you worship another God, whatever that is, maybe that's money. Maybe that's your spouse. Maybe that's your children. Well, I'd do anything for my children. Really? Deny God? Well, if necessary. No. No, I'd do anything except deny God for my children. Period. Period. Because if he's not number one, you're in a dangerous place. And he talks about here, and you could literally go into great detail about the torment and the ascending up, up forever and ever and no rest uh, for worshiping the beast. And that's what he says, for worshiping the beast and his image. It's about worship. It's about worship. It's about worship. And when you take the mark of the beast, if you're here during that time, if we're all here during that time, you're going to have to deny Christ before you will get that mark. You're going to have to worship another God. We talked today about, me and Jim talked a little bit about, settle it in your heart right now. You know why I've gained 30 pounds during COVID? Straight up, do you know why? We can blame anything on the planet. But my head's not been in the game of losing weight or keeping it off, period. And Romans 12 tells me that if I will renew my mind, if you want to do something and you want it bad enough, and you set your heart on it, the enemy can't stop it. But if your heart and your mind is not set on it, you will waver along the way. You will falter along the way. I, I don't even try to lose weight right now because my head's not in the game. Straight up truth. Do I want to? Yeah. Am I frustrated? Yeah, but not enough to settle it. Because once I settle it, the weight will come off. That's fact. You don't need the next new... I said that to say this, though. Settle your relationship with God as number one. You may be tried, you may be tested, but you don't want to get to a place where, and it could happen in America, you don't want to get to a place where you have to either deny Christ or do without food. Because when that moment comes, Jesus did not settle it on the cross. He settled it in the garden. He made the decision in the garden before he ever went to the cross. And if you haven't settled it, settle it. Period. If people have done you wrong, find a way to get over it. Get junk out of your life. Cleanse yourself because scripture plainly says, when it comes right down to it, you better have known without a doubt and not just spewing words out. How many times, I know I got to go and I'm rambling, but how many times have you heard somebody say, my wife ever cheats on me, I kill her. You've heard stuff like that or a woman say it. At the end of the day, when the wife or the husband cheats, nobody kills anybody because it's just words. Settle your relationship with God in your heart, period. If you're out there watching and you got a casual relationship, it's probably time to get it less than casual, a whole lot clearer, settled. That I'm going to serve God no matter what. Period. You guys are here every week on Wednesday nights. You've got it settled, right? Moving on. Ha. Any comments there? By the way, that's Matthew 10, 28. It says, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but the one who can kill the body and soul. Go ahead, Mark. 
But speak loud. Pull your mask down. Speak loud. We justify it in our own mind. So, to for those of you online, M Brother Mark Scott was talking about in uh, Romans chapter six, and and literally we get to a place where we justify sin in our own life. I'm paraphrasing, shorter version maybe, but um, he does a better job explaining sometimes than I do. But but the we justify sin in our life and one of the biggest sins that we justify as born again children of God is unforgiveness well I just can't let go of that or, 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 or he said she said so what what did Jesus say and, and literally we become complacent if we're not careful then we begin to justify we forget as he said we forget because we want so much of forgiving God we forget that forgiveness only comes with justification you can't have love without judgment. Does that make sense? Is that kind of justice to what you said? Mostly sort of roundabout? Yeah. Uh, very good, very good. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven say unto me, Write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. That's kind of one of the things that we got on a little bit earlier, your works. Your works. If God gives you wisdom and knowledge to teach, you ought to be teaching. If God gives you wisdom, knowledge, and a calling to preach, you ought to be preaching. You ought to be doing what God called you to do. Those are your works. And he said your works will follow you. They will get rest from their labors, which if we look at it in a sense, those that died, the rest from their labors is heaven, right? But then he says their works will follow them. Just food for thought. Ha! Here's the promise, the patience, the victory of the saints. They kept the faith, hold on, press forward. The promise is greater than the pain. The promise is greater than the pain. Uh, what is it? Where's the verse at? For I reckon that, these, that this uh, present trouble cannot compare. I'm par paraphrasing it, but for I reckon that this current trouble cannot compare to the glory that will be shown in us through him. So, Again, I know this isn't exactly the way you want to study this, but... And the voice said, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, which mean from here on, that they will rest from their labors and their works will follow them. The same promise we have in Matthew 25, 21, promise of reward for good works. 1 Corinthians 3, promise the opposite for no works. Uh, our sins are forgiven, but our works follow us. Saved by the fire alone, says you did very little for God afterwards. Uh, my opinion, it's, it, there's a lot going on there that I'm going to skip. I've got some notes on it, but I'm going to skip them because it's not just heaven and hell. It is, but how many grew up with the old song, Lord, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land? I... I I personally believe, my opinion, that there's one big mansion and we're all going to live in it. I'm going to be next door to Jesus. That's just my belief. It's in my Father's house are many rooms. Rooms is what it says. And if you go back to Jewish tradition when he was teaching on this, here's what he says. 
go back to your father's house and build on a room. And when the room is ready, then the father will say, go get your bride. And it goes all the way through the Jewish wedding, through all of that. It's all laid out. It's literally laid out in the Old Testament from the word go all the way back. You can study it out and it's there. Moving on. Verse 14. Ha! Wait for it. Ha! Coming from the back. From the peanut gallery back there. I love that peanut gallery. Uh, verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Having on his head a golden crown. And in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Um, anybody believe that's a good thing? Some believe that reaping in this, this verse is about drinking out the Christians. Others believe that it relates to Old Testament where he literally says, when you begin to reap, you're going to destroy the enemy. You're going to cut down the enemy. So I, we'll, we'll break it down a little bit more. But another, verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Uh, this pertains to, or at least is the beginning of pertaining to, the battle of Armageddon. This is pertaining to, based from Joel 3, 13, for the harvest is ripe. I foretold, it was foretold long before that the winepress was full and that the wickedness was great. And it was a day of atonement or reckoning. So you can see this as him reaping the, the harvest of the saved, but you can also see this as him reaping the earth and taking back, cutting out the vines and the bad and the wicked, uh, because it was foretold in Joel chapter 3 that this would happen, that the sickle would be placed in and that it would be cut down. Um, if this is relating, we know this is the end of the tribulation right here, or at least this moment in time, that's what he's talking about. It literally can relate to the Day of Atonement. So if you go back to the feast, um, the first feast, our spring feast, the fall feast, our trumpet, which we believe relates to the rapture, then the Day of Atonement at the end of the tribulation, or the tribulation up to the culmination, the end of it, and then the the Feast of Tabernacles, which would be the thousand-year millennial reign on earth, uh, which we will talk about some in the near future. But with that being said, atonement is always paying for sins. And it's the, the three-fall feast. And so when he talks about this as the atonement or the time has come for atonement, think about it from two angles. One is that he's going to take out those that are righteous, but also that he's going to destroy those that are evil. Comments? Questions? Can the timeline continue? Okay. Uh, did he talk about this verse in the coming six weeks? When he talked about last week, he said he was three and a half years for us to add in between the time of Israel. So I guess my question is, you're saying this is the, is this the end of the three and a half years? That's the end of the seven years, or the last three and a half. So then is the angel giving people a chance to repent? So for the thousand-year millennial reign on earth, which comes at the end of the tribulation, there will be a people on the earth having babies, and, and so the gospel will be preached before Satan is released at the end. But I would also say this. This is kind of the way this works in, uh, in Revelation, or at least the way I believe it works, is he will give you a chunk of what's happening, and then he'll go back and start and break it down. So we would got through to the beginning of the first three years, three and a half. Now he's going to give us a, a nugget of, of what's going to end it, and then he'll go back and begin to start breaking it down again. 
So the timelines are confusing. She was asking about the timelines, and they are confusing because a lot of it's speculation. You know, you have every theologian out there that will tell you, well, this is the way it has to be, and then this one, this is the way it has to be, and Mark and myself have discussed this in great detail. Ten years from now, if the world is still standing, theologians will see it a different way because that's simply the, the nature of the beast and the culture beginning to, to show us how things are working. Go ahead. I, I don't believe there'll ever be animal sacrifices again. Christ is the atonement for our sins. But, but when the raptured saints, if you believe in a rapture, come back and he purifies the earth, whether that be with a sickle or whatever, if he purifies the earth, then the Jewish people will begin to repopulate those that came through the tribulation and there's a thousand year reign on earth and then Satan will be loosed and they'll have to make a choice. One of the reasons I believe in the rapture is because uh, it talks about being sealed. If you accept Christ before the tribulation, then you're sealed. Uh, so I can't give you specific timelines. Others can, uh, uh, me and Mark could sit here and discuss it for hours, but at the end of the day, it's only speculation, the timelines. But you've got to know that when Christ returns to set his foot on the Mount of Olives, that's the, the culmination of it. That's the end. That's. He doesn't do that until the very end. So, but again, what we're studying tonight, he'll go back and start breaking down more of details over the next few chapters. Uh, it's just, it's kind of a, a cause and effect or an effect and cause if you want to. So I've studied this book a dozen times, and to be honest, I learn something new every time. Go ahead. Very good way of looking at it. Yep. So to explain that the way Mark did, which was excellent, by the way, uh, if you want to go see a movie, you watch the trailer for it. It shows you some highlights, and then you go watch the movie, and you see the rest of the, of the movie, and then you go, oh, wow, it didn't play out the way the, tra you know, the trailer made it look, but no, but that's kind of the way Revelation is. It shows you a, a nugget here, and then it'll break it down. It shows you a nugget, and then it'll break it down, and so it, it's, it's like watching trailers. Um, three and a half years is when God's wrath begins to be poured out. That's when it's settled. Those that were going to accept, I believe, have accepted uh, until the millennial reign. And then that changes things. And we can certainly do a study on that thousand years if you'd like. Again, so for Miss Faye's question, atonement means to pay for your sins. Jesus is our atonement for our sins. We don't need to sacrifice any animals. Um, the picture of that is in, uh, in the wilderness in Egypt. Um, when Israel came out and God told Moses to strike the rock, the next time all he had to do was speak to the rock. The rock is the representation of Christ Jesus. He only had to be sacrificed once. There, there will be sacrificing, I believe, in the tribulation, but not at the return of Christ. The Jews will be sacrificing that have never accepted Christ as Messiah. They'll be sacrificing in waiting on the return of the Messiah. And then the Antichrist will come in and desecrate the temple and, and sacrifice a pig there, which we know that from that point on they would never they'd destroy it before they'd use it again after that. So let me move on. 
verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, verse 18, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, not the vine of heaven, the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So we've got the fifth and sixth angels that we've talked about tonight at the closing of this book or this chapter. And the sixth and fifth, it commands that they thrust in and they remove the vine of the earth. Now that is literally the wicked. We understand that. That is not Christians in this verse. We're not sure about the first verse, but this one, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, John 15, 1. But the fruit of the true vine is you and I and the Christian world and the Jews that accept Christ as Savior. The fruit of the vine on the earth, however, yields imitation fruit, false prophet, the beast, uh, mock, if you will. Uh, the picture here is gruesome as Satan and the beast and the false prophet. They pool everything they have against in one last stitch effort. And this is the battle of Armageddon coming up. And uh, they literally, it says that there is approximately, uh, it's estimated it'll be a 200 million man army. 200 million men. And whether you get into, again, there's a good study here. 1,600 furlongs, does anybody know how, how much that is? Somewhere between 180 and 200 miles, the, the valley of Megiddo. And the scripture says that the blood will run to the horse's neck, or to the horse's bridle. Uh, and, and believe it or not, there is researchers that have done this. This is why I tell you, this: the Battle of Armageddon is a good study. If all you've ever done is watch the movie, and you, and you got it covered, you got enough, cool, go with that. But if you really want to dig in it and study it, and you take the amount of men that should be in this, this battle, and you take the blood that's in those bodies, and then you take and put them in the valley of Megiddo, uh, where Armageddon will take place, uh, Megiddo, Megiddo, however you pronounce it, the blood will be 180 to 200 miles as high as the horse's neck. I ain't staying for that. Good Lord willing, I don't want to be here for that. Uh, somebody said at my birthday they prayed for me another 50 years. I'm going to slap them sideways. <laughs> Let me finish up here. That means that there will be blood that runs for 180 miles at its peak will come up to the horse's bridle. It will literally be a sea of blood. That is not a sea of water that looks like blood. That is not what it says. It says it's blood. Scripture calls this place Armageddon or the Mount of Megiddo, uh, if that's how I pronounce it. Uh, interesting note, 10 out of 11 times that the word of God's passionate anger are used in Revelation. When you see God being angry in Scripture, it's not passionate anger. It's not wrath poured out until you get to Revelation. Then it's wrath poured out anger. And that is when he's done. Uh, and we'll let you talk. we got about 10 minutes. Uh, a funny note here. How many, how many know the battle hymn of the Republic? <laughs> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. It's kind of crazy that the song that relates to America talks about the return of God and to the destruction of earth, or at least the people of the earth. Because he's going to purify it and make it where we can all live here. And then there's going to be a thousand year reign. Uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in sitting with some of you if you'd like and talk about what you think your role will be at that time. Um, Here's what I believe, and then we'll, we'll give it to you guys. I believe those that go in the, in the rapture 
or have died in Christ before the tribulation will be sealed. I don't believe there'll be an option. You'll have a glorified body. It's not going to be the same for us. It's going to be different. Those that remain on the earth that made it through the tribulation, whether that be millions, whether that be hundreds of thousands, they will have to live during that thousand-year reign. They'll hear the gospel. They'll know what's going on. They'll, and, and it might be that we're actually even guiding them. But every single one of them has an opportunity to die without Christ. Even with him here with us on earth. It, again, I may be wrong on this, but that's the way I see the thousand year reign. Uh, anybody with comments or questions? Absolutely. Uh, there could be, yes. That's right. Absolutely. There, is, there will still be those that fall away. Satan will be loose for a season. And there will be those that are drawn away and enticed by things of the world. Um, it is literally going to happen again. For them, not for us. I believe not for us, but that's my beliefs. I don't have 100% scripture to back that. Simply because I believe in the rapture and I have scripture to back the rapture then that's why I believe that we'll be sealed. One, one more observation. I think the setting of the new covenant, Christ got it out of the way. And that point, Speak a little bit louder. From the time that Christ cut the new covenant, we have second coming. The word says that if you have rejected And if you, you know, there is an unpardonable sin. And I believe if you break that down, and, and many theologians, many of you in the room may believe it differently. But the only sin that is not forgivable is rejecting the Holy Spirit until he walks away. That's, I mean, it, it's literally, uh, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost is to tell him no enough times. And, and if he ever leaves you, then and I, I personally, and I've heard people, and I know back in the day the little track went around about the father that wanted to be saved and couldn't. If there's a calling in your heart to know Christ, you've not gone too far. Because the only way you can have a calling to want him is through the Holy Spirit calling you. That's just, again. But here's the nutshell of this thing. We should rejoice if we are truly sold out to him. Now, what does sold out to him mean? Uh, Sterling, can I use you for a second? Just uh, in, Every time I talk to Sterling or every time I hear from Sterling or what Sterling's doing, he's out ministering. He's finding somebody to minister to. That is not because he's required to. It's because he loves his Lord so much that he wants to do for his Savior. There is very few days that I get up and go, oh, I, I wish, I'm so glad God called me to be a pastor. Truth be told, I can make a lot more money doing other things. But at the end of the day, I do what I do, not because of, of, of paycheck. I do what I do because I love my Savior. And he's asked me to do this. And I can't wait to get here to do that, not because I enjoy uh, being in front of people, none of that, but it's because I love him. And if your heart isn't to a place where you love to do for the Lord, then check yourself because maybe you're not at that place where 
Because honestly, it's not about the works. That's not going to get you there. But if you truly love somebody, you want to do things for them. You want to do things for them. It's not, oh Lord, I got to go to heaven again. I mean, I got to go to church again. It's not, well, I guess I ought to worship today. It's not, well, I, it, that's not what it's about. It's literally about who can I share Jesus with? Who can, because I love him so much that I want to do this for him. That's where your relationship with God needs to be. That's why we learn the book of Revelation and other things. Because honestly, at the end of the day, if you don't love him like that, my job isn't to save the world. I can't save one of them. My job is to teach you that you might want to go do those things. You and the worship team. I don't know what you do outside of the worship team for his ministry because you don't talk a lot. You, you, you like to know other people's stuff, but you don't share any of your stuff, which <laughs> makes other people not want to share with you, to be honest. But, but you're always here early. He, truth is truth. I mean, you're always here early. You're always here ready, and it's never, it's never like it's a massive chore because it's what you're doing for the kingdom of God. And when it, it shouldn't be a chore. I mean, I know people drag in the very last minute and leave a minute before it's over, and that's, to me, man, you ought to want to be here. You ought to want to be in the house of God. You ought to, you ought to be uh, excited about what God's doing. You ought to say, man, what can I do today? And, and when you don't like the song... We sing them old hymnals, and I got to be honest, I'm 35 years into those things. They're worn out in my brain. I'll fly away, should have flown away a long time ago. But he's still worthy of my praise during I'll fly away. He didn't change one iota because of the song that's being sung. Your son sung about cigarettes and tattoos and how that doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is loving people. And if I love him, my nugget, and I'll hush. You've heard me say this before, some of you, but I'm going to share it again real quick. And then we can talk among ourselves and we'll tell everybody out there we love them, goodbye. But if you were standing in line every morning asking God for what you need from him, and you looked up there and really looked into his face. And you knew that there's a world out there of his children that have been kidnapped by the enemy. And he hasn't asked you for a thing. And you look at your list of what you need from him. And you truly look at his hurting heart. It should make us want to tear our list up. And just walk up and say, what can I do to help you get your children back? Because that's what love is. What am I doing to help the father with his children that have been kidnapped and manipulated by the enemy? What am I doing? to? Because if I look into his eyes, there's a lost and dying world. And I can't even get up and come to church twice a week. And he gave his all for me. Where is my love for him? Where is my love for him? Love for him makes me want to work. And you, because I know we had people lined up here today to help deliver backpacks. And that wasn't necessarily an easy chore if you had one of those schools where you had to carry them all in and you were the only one carrying. <laughs> but it's about, it's about Loving him so much that what I want's on the back burner because what I truly want, and I can say that to you guys because you're faithful. Talking like this to some is offensive because they don't want to hear that, that we should do something for him. It's all about what he can do for us. It's all about gimme, 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 gimme. And let me tell you what happened in the Bible. If you go back to Genesis and start there and come back, when they get, began to worship what he could do for them and the temple that he put them in, he just let it be destroyed. Because it became more about the, the worship of the building, it became more about the worship of what he could do for them than it could. Do you know when God moves? 
God, forgive me, I don't mean to ever offend you again. When they truly begin, see, I could preach right here. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is my strength. I've got to be joyful. It's not what it says. It says the joy of the Lord. They were sitting on the rooftops in sackcloth and ashes, weeping before God, and he got joy out of the fact that they realized they needed to repent and move forward, and he gave them supernatural power, not because they were grinning from ear to ear, but because they were repenting before him, and they were able to reconstruct the wall around Israel, and they did it because they repented before God and wanted what he wanted and not what they wanted. What does that mean to you? I don't know. All I know is this. If you love somebody, you do everything you can for them. Jim Nelson might fly all the way to Utah and hang out with Kathy's family. Not because he wanted to hang out with them. He'd have rather been at home watching the Dodgers. But he loves Kathy. And Kathy wanted to meet her family. So jump on a plane and here we go. Because that's what love does. Anyway. Father, thank you again for tonight. Lord, I, I don't ever let me come across in a bad way, Lord. I don't want to do that. I just want your people to understand how urgent it is that our love for you is so strong that we want to do for you. Because I can't fathom what it would be like for my children created in my image to be kidnapped by an enemy being tormented, tortured, and put to an eternal flame. And my other children not caring. So God, I'll just keep preaching it and trying to grow in you that we can be more like you every day. Your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us out there. Good night. God bless you. The rest of us, we can talk all night if you want. I'm on the Harley, so I don't care.